as an astronaut, you need to be fit, yes, clever. So-so. Great under pressure. <laughs> yes. An expert in science. Uh, you need to be good at science. There's one other thing that I realised you have to be as an astronaut these days, and I realised it, I think, the first time you spoke when you were in space, and that is you have to be a fabulous communicator and ambassador for space. Mm -hmm. And that's what you are. Yes, I mean, it's a hugely privileged position to be able to go into space. So it helps if you can come back and talk about it, talk about your experiences and, you know, pass on my enthusiasm for, for this subject onto other people. Was it part of the job description? Because space needs good PR at the moment, doesn't it? Because it costs a lot of money and there's a lot of argument over, you know, mm. who pays for it. Actually, no. I mean, the, the communication element is more to do with you getting on with your crewmates and also getting on in a multicultural environment. You're up there with Russians, with Japanese, Canadians, 22 members of Europe, uh, all working together. So when it came to the selection process, day one were what we call the hard skills, the, the stuff that you can either do or you can't do. Mm. And then the rest of the year was all the, the soft skills. It was the communication, it was the teamwork, the leadership, being a good follower too, all of those kind of things. And, and so I think naturally what the space agency wanted in terms of an astronaut was also the kind of skills that would make you a good ambassador. You have more than one day's training on the hard skills though. I, I think I heard you say you have one day training on the what, hard skills. One things. day testing. All right, okay. One day testing, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say probably it, a bit more practice it, than that. It, it was the most intense day of the whole selection <laughs> process. It, it was about 12 hours in front of a computer screen and that's when they were looking at things like memory retention, concentration, spatial awareness, a bit of engineering, a bit of science, a bit of maths. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was just a whole day of, of the hard skill testing. So earlier this year we went to NASA to their HERA project which is looking at how to get the right mix of people for long space missions and yeah. they made the point that it's not just one type of person that you need if you had a spaceship full of one type of person that wouldn't work so do you have any yeah. views on the type of mix that you need to have on board? I think what we're trying to achieve is, is a really good diverse team uh, yes, you do need a, a, a mix of different types of people on board but with a mixture of different skills. And this is going to be so much more important for the longer duration missions coming to the Moon and to Mars, purely because you will want a medical doctor as part of that crew, I'm sure. Um, you'll probably want a trained geologist as well. Um, you'll want somebody who's an expert with piloting skills. Um, and, and so you are naturally going to have people who've got slightly different backgrounds. But also in terms of personality and character as well, I think you've got to have people who are flexible. Um, somebody needs to be the leader uh, and everybody needs to accept that. And you know, if you're all extremely strong personalities, uh, who don't accept you know, the, the subordinate position very well, that's not going to work. Which one were you? A mix. I think that's what, uh, same with my classmates as well. People who can take on the leadership roles, who can step up to the plate when it's needed, but also people who can instantly fall into a supporting role, come up with solutions, help out your leader, you know, relieve their workload, understand the stresses that a leader's under. So the, the ability to switch between the two is very important. So I'm guessing you were that type of person before you went into space. Um, have you brought any of the astronauts back with you? Do you deal with life differently now to how you did before? Um, yes, it, I'm, I'm, I've always been quite calm. I think I'm even more so, having flown in space. Um, if ever there's anything I think that is going to be a challenge for me, I can always draw on my experience from spaceflight. And sometimes I've thought to myself, you know, Pete, you did a spacewalk, I'm sure you can do this. <laughs> you know, and I, I've had to give myself a bit of a talking to and think, yes, you know, you're absolutely right, I can do this. Uh, so, so yes, but I, I do draw on you know, my experiences throughout my life. This is a question from my son. He wanted to know, what is it like to float in space? Floating is the best fun feeling ever. Um, it, you know, firstly, it's really relaxing all the muscles, if you just let yourself go limp, your body actually adopts a, a, a strange shape, almost like a semi-sitting shape. Your, your shoulders become very hunched because there's no gravity pulling them down. Um, very liberating, very relaxing. But then you can mess around in, in you know, weightlessness and you do spins and flips and push yourself around the space station, see if you, how far you can get without hit, bouncing off a wall. Uh, you can have endless fun in weightlessness. 
you did a spacewalk, first Brit to do a spacewalk. There were a few minutes when you didn't have to do the work mm. while you were waiting for the sun to go down. What was that like? Yeah. Um, it's that, that view anyway of Earth from space is absolutely incredible. But to be able to go outside the space station, see it through just a thin visor, and to be looking one direction at the Earth as it slowly, you know, as you slowly go from day to night, and as the space station was passing into the shadow of the Earth, and then all the city lights were coming out, um, and then your world sh shrinks down from this marvelous view of the Earth to this very small view of just what's illuminated by your headlights. Um, but then at the same time, then when you look back the other way from Earth, you see the, the incredible stars of the Milky Way and the universe. It, it's, it's the most surreal environment to be in. I've spoken to other astronauts and they pretty much all say, what I suspect you would say as well, that it just changes your perspective on the world. And I wondered if you could share your words about you know, what, what your realizations were up there. What was your experience? How did it change you? Yeah, it does on, on a number of different levels. So it's purely the point of, of actually being able to put things into perspective, literally seeing the Milky Way, the, the, you know, the Earth, the Sun, the other planets, and being removed from it all. So a very mm. detached view literally puts things, things into perspective. But also that feeling of, of calm, actually, it's, it's of serenity outside on a spacewalk. I was, I was surprised by that. I thought it would be you know, high adrenaline. Um, there were moments of high adrenaline, absolutely, but the overall feeling that I took away from that experience was one of being very detached, very remote, very surreal, but very calming, very serene just having this incredible view of the Earth. Um, and, and that's, I think, what changes people when you see the Earth from space. Everyone's talking about climate change and global warming. There's increased geopolitical problems around the world. And I wonder whether having been up there, you think there's a use to being able to actually see it from that perspective. And, and you know, whether there are certain types of people then, if not specific people, you, you think could do with a dose of space. Yeah, I think it's an expensive way of, of you know, treating you know, individuals. But you're absolutely right. Anybody who goes up into space will come back with a fresh appreciation of what we have back here on the planet. Firstly, by looking back at the planet and realizing how beautiful it is and how fragile. When you mm. see the atmosphere uh, and you see it's 16 kilometers thick, it's not endless, and all of the gas that keeps us alive on Earth is trapped in that tiny, tiny layer, mm. you suddenly realize that what we put into that layer is really important. Um, and it's, you know, it's very easy on Earth to look up and see a clear blue sky mm. and think it goes on forever, and of course the Earth will clean that for us. Um, and also, you know, when you look back out into space, you realize that Earth is a one-off in our solar system at least. Um, you know, Mars is inhospitable, Venus is very inhospitable. Uh, these are, are planets that are similar to Earth, but Earth is it. Uh, and mm. when we say there's no planet B, you know, there really isn't. We're not gonna be traveling outside of our solar system for many, many hundreds of years, if at all. Um, it, and so we have to focus on what we've got. And this is the planet that sustains life in our solar system. If you were king of the world, but you had to face the realities of you know, business making money and poorer nations becoming richer nations. How would you curtail what we are doing to the environment? The point is that you know, going green doesn't mean not making money and it doesn't mean stopping countries that are poor, you know, improving their quality of, of life. We just need to make the decisions to do it. Um, I mean, one you know, interesting fact is that the sun provides 7,000 times more energy than we need, 7,000 times more. We are pretty clever as humans. We have the knowledge and the understanding and the engineering and the technology to be able to convert 7,000 times that energy that we need. Uh, and we just need to make the decision to do it. Um, it costs a lot of money, you see, so. Well, it doesn't, if, if we invest in technology, then the, the cost comes down and the efficiency goes up. Um, I mean, for example, what we're doing with small satellites is because the satellites are reducing in size, so the solar panels are reducing in size, so the efficiency of the solar panels have to go up. So space is one of those environments that is forcing industry 
to improve the efficiency of solar panels. And then when we do that and the cost comes down because there's no point in making a tiny satellite that's very expensive, that becomes again unusable. So it has to not only be efficient, it has to be cheaper. Then you end up with efficient, cheap solar panels and then suddenly you know, solar panels on roofs become acceptable and become the norm and generate far more electricity. So it's a case of having business models that start to work and start to you know, improve economically and also that can be used in third world countries to provide electrical power. They can also be used literally anywhere. So for disaster relief, for example, when you need energy supply in the middle of nowhere. Um, so there are so many applications for this. It, it is a case of changing minds and making that initial step, that initial decision to do something. How would you change the minds of the people that make these decisions? Because we look around and so far it doesn't look like it's happening. I think the minds are are starting to change. Mm -hmm. We've 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 seen the the you know the recent climate crisis uh, impact that's been having the demonstrations. So I think minds are starting to change. Um, I think we need to continue investing in technology in STEM because you know we have some challenges and technology is going to provide the solution. Um, but we need to have good discussions. We need to have bright people involved. And we need to do it in an incremental manner without any knee-jerk reactions because the one thing about this model that we're playing with is we don't want to introduce unintended consequences. And it is a very, very difficult model. Uh, I mean, uh, trying to understand global environmental um, you know, uh, dynamics is incredibly challenging. Mm. And so when we're talking about, um, you know, introducing different uh, power supplies, for example, making sure that there aren't unintended consequences from our actions. But it, it's a challenge that we need to address right now, without, yeah. without a doubt, right now. But, but yes, I mean, to our younger generation, it is their future. And of course, we need to empower them to have the tools to be able to deal with the problems that we are currently facing. 2020 could possibly be the year when space tourists begin to take their first flights. That's what we've been told in the last mm -hmm. 12 months. I wonder if you think space is a place for tourists? I think it is. Um, I think it's very much going to be very much like aviation. You know, in the beginning, uh, it was about professional aviators learning how to fly and then using aviation purely to do professional jobs. Uh, then it's a case of transportation and then people do it for sport and do it for fun and now look at, at how many people are finding all sorts of ways to get themselves in the air to have fun. Um, I think space will be the same. Um, at the moment it's very much the domain of the national space agencies and astronauts who are part of those national space agency programs. Um, but we are about to see, uh, well we already have seen, you know, space tourists or space flight participants as they're called, um, and we are going to see more and more people, you know, having access to space. I think it's a great thing. I think it's it, the more people who can go up there and experience this, the, the better. And also it's broadening what we can do in space. Um, and it's bringing the costs of access to space down as well. As, as we move towards this commercial model, it's opening it up to, to more people. I, I think some of the technologies that are being explored right now with space tourism, certainly suborbital space tourism, have a real future in suborbital transportation. The, the London to Sydney in an hour and a half mm. you know, model. Uh, I think that's really exciting. You trained for goodness knows how long to go to space and yet the idea that we're sending out you know, pretty untrained people into what I still think is a really dangerous environment. I mean, uh -huh. do you think we are overstepping what we should be selling as tourism? I think we need to be careful about who we're sending into what environment with what level of training and who's looking after them. Um, it's a bit like when you, if you go scuba diving, for example. Um, it's okay to go scuba diving as a novice if you're with an instructor who knows what they're doing and can get you out of a situation, or free fall parachuting, you know, if you're doing a tandem jump, you're clearly being looked after. Same with space flight. It's okay to go into space if you're, uh, you know, a, a tourist or a space flight participant. 
if you are with professional astronauts who know what they're doing. We're not asking them to do spacewalks. We're not asking them to capture cargo vehicles with a robotic arm. We're not asking them to handle uh, technical you know, problems that might occur. We're asking them to know how to look after themselves in an emergency, how to understand their spacesuit uh, and the basic life support systems. So a much reduced training package. Um, but you're absolutely right, we do need to think about the psychological profile of, of individuals, uh, whether they've got the right personality to still get on as, as a crew, um, and the ability to stay calm under pressure. So we do still need to make sure that it's the right type of people. It's not suitable for everybody. Right, so you are the space tourist instructor. I've just bought a ticket to space, I'm a novice. What are your top tips for how to enjoy it and what not to do? And I'm thinking, do I eat before I fly? Do we take off on the in-breath or the out-breath? <laughs> where do I brace? What do I expect? Do I look at the horizon? Have you got any tips for me? Uh, I, the, the biggest tip is to relax and enjoy it. Um, because you know you, you don't have to really worry about all those things. Um, you know, if you're yes, relaxed, you do, Tim. This is, if you're relaxed, you, him, you, you don't have to worry about it from a trained <laughs> astronaut. <laughs> you, you will, you will, you know, you'll naturally, you will just enjoy the experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think this training is is what will help you to relax. So get in the simulator. You know, know what to expect. Get in the centrifuge, know what the G-forces feel like. Um, there's no getting away from the training. And we, that's why we train and train and train. That's why we sweat the small stuff as astronauts. It's so that we can sit on top of a rocket and be fairly relaxed, because we kind of know what's coming. If you could go anywhere in space, if you could visit any celestial body, mm. and you know, distance was no object, where, what fascinates you most? Um, there are, it's difficult to narrow it down to just one place. I, I, loved, I love the idea of going to Mars because I think it is probably the most fascinating planet other than Earth in our solar system. Um, to, to have changed so much over its history, you know, we, we know that it once had an atmosphere very similar to Earth. It, a third of its surface was covered by water. Um, it still has water ice. Uh, you know, it's incredibly interesting and, and it could possibly have have sustained life or even may even be micro microorganisms you know, living on Mars. So Mars is, a, is definitely a candidate, but also I think um, some of Saturn and Jupiter's moons. Um, Titan, we've already landed a probe there and it is, is yeah. crazy, the lakes yeah. of methane on Titan, who'd have thought? Liquid oceans under um, Enceladus and Europa. Uh, wow, I mean, incredible places. Um, so I think in the solar system there, there are lots of places, but Mars would probably win. Oh, God. Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you Thank so you very much for your time.